get started, and let me, um, well, for, well, first let me say that Representative Donahue, uh, it looks like she's not going to be joining us, but she has frozen pipes and is um, oh, no. dealing with some at-home issues, especially since she's also hosting some other people in her home at the current time. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't expect her to join us. If she does, we'll walk her. Um, so what we're, what we're looking to do here today is to take another, uh, is to lay, in, lay before the committee another important piece of Vermont, of the policy around the Vermont health care system. And, um, and what uh, we've, we have, we've, heard, we've heard some overview of the history of health care reform in the state of Vermont, some efforts that went forward, some efforts that didn't go forward. Uh, just for me to frame it and say that we are in the midst of health care reform in the state of Vermont, there's, so that there's no confusion about whether or not Vermont has moved for, has taken significant steps forward in terms of health care reform. Some of the efforts did not materialize the way that uh, were anticipated, but others have taken uh, significant movement forward. And today, well, I've invited uh, Ina Bacchus, uh, who's the director of healthcare reform. I'm going to ask you to take the lead, if you would, and maybe even do some introductions of others. Um, but uh, and Mike Costa has communicated he's running late. He'll join us as soon as he can. Um, and but I'm going to start by inviting Ina to uh, <coughs> introduce the, the framework of healthcare reform where we are for now in the state of Vermont. And Ina brings with her a great deal of experience having worked uh, prior to her current position, which I welcome you to describe for us. But I've worked for the Green Mountain, for the Green Mountain Care Board in the midst of uh, actually negotiating uh, a lot of uh, what we're now working with. So, Ina, welcome. We're very pleased to have you here. Thank you. For the record, my name is Ina Backus. I am the director. Oh, okay, so. so. Sounds, sounds like aerobics. <laughs> yeah. Does it? Oh, they're doing aerobics on the roof again, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to stay warm. Not here, though. I don't think I don't know. Sorry, just. Yeah, I read my. Yeah, maybe you could inquire. Yeah. Okay. Let me also say I don't know about others, uh, but with this many people, the room will probably get stuffy and hot. So if you're cold, hang on. <laughs> but it is also chilly in this room. So let's start, and we'll see if we can. If there's anything we can do, because that has the potential, I think, for some of us to give us a hit. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm sorry, you know, let me. Are you start? For the for the record, my name is Ina Backus. I'm the director of healthcare reform at the Agency of Human Services. And thank you for having me here today to talk about Vermont's All Payer Model Accountable Care Organization Agreement. And also, let me introduce the others that are here that are going to be talking about this with you. Mike Barber is from the Green Mountain Care Board. Mike Barber is the Chief of Health Policy at the Green Mountain Care Board. And he'll be talking about the board's uh, role with respect to the All Payer Model Agreement. And Alicia Cooper is the new, Alicia has a new title. Director of Payment Reform and Reimbursement for the Department of Vermont Health Access. And Michael Costa, who will be joining us, is Deputy Commissioner at DIVA. Before we begin in exploring the All Payer Model Agreement, and let me say that we are happy to take questions as we go and to have this be a discussion. And while I'm here talking now, I may turn to the colleagues who are here presenting with me at any point. And then also, they'll have specific uh, portions of this presentation as we have 
a long afternoon schedule together. I'm sure you're all very excited. <laughs> We're going to take some breaks along the way, not, not to fear, but because uh, there's a lot of material in here. There's really a lot of material in uh, I'm going to try to think about how to put this in more manageable pieces. But uh, there's a lot of material. We're certainly open to choose your own adventure. <laughs> <laughs> to begin, I think it's helpful to set some context. And as I understand, the committee has been learning and orienting itself about Vermont's health care system. And one of the things that I'm sure you've now heard many times is the, what the size of Vermont's health care system is. Um, the health care system represents one fifth of our economy upwards of six billion dollars and as such that it's it's very large there are many things that are at play when it comes to health care uh, health care services in Vermont and um, what Vermonters uh, how Vermonters interact with the health care system so I think to that end it's really important that when we're talking about health care reform we're talking about what problem in health care we're trying to address Defining the problem is very important when we're thinking about what the health care reform initiative is. So here we've outlined a couple of potential problems that people could want to solve in health care. Um, for instance, if the problem is uh, increasing access to insurance for people who need it most, there are different interventions there. Um, there could be inter interventions such as the ACA um, and the ACA's broad health insurance reforms, creating the health care insurance marketplace here in Vermont and the exchange. Um, reducing the rate of uninsured. Similarly, the state um, interventions could include changing state or federal law to require insurance, such as uh, an individual mandate. Um, another problem that is one that I think many are very acutely aware of in healthcare is the cost of prescription drugs. Um, when we look at the all-payer model, and we'll talk more about that, the all-payer model for Medicare and for Medicaid doesn't include in it uh, healthcare cost growth targets associated with prescription drugs. So while the all-payer model, as you'll hear, is, is a very broad reform, it's not addressing all of the problems in the healthcare system. It's, per, it's addressing some particular problems. And, and if I could just interrupt and say several of the other, several of the issues, problems that you've listed are addressed in other policy decisions that this committee has been and will be engaged in as well, from the mandate in terms of access to insurance, et cetera. Correct. The, the all-payer model is a major health care reform initiative, no doubt, but it is not an all-encompassing health care reform initiative. It can work in tandem with other initiatives, or it, it may operate on a separate path from other initiatives. If you're looking to solve um, the problem of the cost of healthcare growth uh, being too rapid and unsustainable, and if you're looking to solve uh, the problem that we hear about in our healthcare system a lot, which is a lack of uh, coordinated care, then the all-payer model um, that we are operating in now may be an appropriate approach to those problems. Um, the strategy of the all-payer model specifically is to create a more integrated healthcare system and to do that to move away from fee-for-service reimbursement because we know that fee-for-service reimbursement does not necessarily allow providers the flexibility that they desire to uh, ensure that their patients for whom they're providing care receive um, the services that they most need when they need them. Um, for instance, uh, in, in a fee-for-service reimbursement model, taking the time to coordinate care via phone call is not necessarily something that would be reimbursed. So if that is um, a, a critical part of a care plan and it's not being provided for through a fee-for-service reimbursement, that, that is something that could be addressed through a different model of reimbursement that provides a uh, fixed amount of payment for a certain population of payments. Here in Vermont, the intervention that we are using through the All-Payer Accountable Care Organization is 
a statewide accountable care organization model that is aligned across programs and major payers, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers. And this is an agreement that is facilitated um, by, and this is a model that is facilitated by an agreement that Vermont has with the federal government. And we'll talk more about how we got there. When we say that we want to move towards a more integrated system of care, and that is our goal for creating um, an all-payer accountable care organization model, I think it's useful to think more about what we mean by integrated system of care. And I have a video that I'll share today that describes integration of care in a medical model. And here in this slide, um, the Robert Wood Johnson uh, foundation re describes care integration as something more broad, which is balancing clinical care with prevention-oriented public health and community-based social services to improve health outcomes while driving down costs. That is something certainly that we are hoping for and want to see in the all-payer model, which is if you provide more flexible funding, how will that funding be um, how will that funding be used to create more opportunities to balance the clinical care with the prevention-oriented um, public health and community-based services? In this driver diagram, which gives examples, um, so all the way to the right are some examples of interventions that can or could improve access to care, that could um, create more balance and integration in the system and that can improve consumer experience and quality. You see population-based health-based alternative payment models in the last um, in the last example in terms of improving consumer experience and quality. And that is because the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation believes that that more flexible funding model can more appropriately meet consumer needs for the variety of, of care. How did we get to an all-payer accountable care organization model agreement in Vermont? How did we decide that we um, should pursue a, a alternative payment model, that we should pursue specifically an alternative payment model that is um, global in nature versus uh, pay, for, pay for performance or um, other uh, enhanced fee for service payments? Um, it took a long time to get here. We uh, began negotiations with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation in 2014. And those negotiations took two years. Um, and those negotiations came on the foundation of other reform initiatives that you've heard about in this committee. Those reforms include the Blueprint for Health, um, patient-centered medical home model. They also included the early ACO aligned shared savings programs that Vermont uh, pursued in part through the state innovation model grant that we were awarded in 2013. And seeing those reforms coupled together um, and the, the, uh, the potential for the ACO model, we wanted to see if we shifted more risk to providers, um, if that was something that we could bring to fruition in a statewide model. So like I said, we negotiated for two years with the federal government to arrive at the model that we're now implementing. In the model that, that, that we're talking about here, in the how, how unique is it? Is this happening everywhere? It's not happening everywhere. No. <laughs> the, the federal government and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is very much uh, promoting two-sided risk models for accountable care organization, organizations. And that comes from their learning having operated one-sided risk, shared savings programs, and then venturing into what is called the next generation program for ACOs which is what Vermont's model is based on, the next generation program. 
Uh, and the federal government believes and wants to incentivize <coughs> multiple payers to be a part of these models together because that aligns the incentives. It means that more of providers' patients are, are in the model, so when they change how, um, when things are changing, it's happening on behalf of more people and it's, it's less likely that a provider will feel as though their foot is in two canoes, although that is certainly um, still to be expected as there's a transition from fee-for-service to value-based payment models. However, um, Vermont is extremely unique in operating its current model, wherein the payment has is shifting in a risk-based model for all major payer groups. There are two ACOs in the United States who are receiving fixed uh, prospective payments from Medicare, and One Care Vermont is one of those ACOs. What's the other one? I don't know the name of the other one. So we, you, we've used already a lot of terms which yes. are like, I have to say, you know, like <laughs> next generation, this is like a city brand. And there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of words that don't really have any inherent meaning if you're mm -hmm. trying to understand this mm -hmm. without going deep, deep into the um, history of all of that. Um, is, there a way, is there a way for us to just, actually, let me back up and say, well, so I think for some folks it's like, well, weren't we going to do something else once upon a time? The state was like really big and high on this other whole major initiative we heard through the healthcare reform and it was like single payer and all this, and that didn't happen. How did we get from that not happening to this starting now? Is that something you can help us with? Sure, and I think Michael can also help with that now that he's here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Michael. And I'm, offer, and I'm offering him Representative Dodger's chair, not a place at the tables per se, but just, yeah. but because I don't think she's coming in. How you see it? If we if we go back to Act 48 of 2011, and we think about the, that was a very uh, large led piece of legislation, and it did many things at once, including putting the state on the path for a universal and unified health care system, but also creating the Green Mountain Care Board, providing it with payment reform pilot authority, and expecting that payment reform pilots would be a way to contain health care cost growth. Meaning that if there is not, if there aren't mechanisms to contain the gross growth of health care, then a unified and universal system, just like the system we're in now, would not be sustainable. I don't know if there's, so we were on a tandem course, both pursuing universal and unified system and specifically how to provide for that via tax funding. Um, and and cost containment strategies. So this is not so. So that's helpful. Actually, I mean, I, I, at least it's helpful to me. I don't know if it's helpful to anyone else. That when Act 48, which we haven't yet actually reviewed in detail here in the committee, we re we referenced it, but it was a major piece of legislation to set out the parameters of healthcare reform in the state of Vermont. What the what the principles would be. Um, they used to be on the wall before the mold got them, and they haven't uh, reinstated them or done some other version of it still. Um, but that, that set in motion both the possibility of how to pursue universal coverage as well as to, and what we're talking about here is the other path of payment reform that was parallel with that. If, yes. Yes. Which we're still on, which, we, which we've continued to move down that path. Uh, and that's part of it. So I'm just trying to, I just think it's somehow helpful to frame this in the largest, the large picture where we are and how we've got here. I don't know, Michael, is there anything that? <clears throat> uh, for, for the record, Michael Costa, Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Vermont Health Access, and someone both extremely grateful for this seat and really uncomfortable uh, <laughs> in the hot seat of the legislature. Uh, you know, having been involved with healthcare reform in Vermont for a number of years, 
that it really got back to, so what problem are you trying to solve right, in, in healthcare? And, and one was a universal health insurance program, particularly making sure everybody gets an insurance card and, and you have a way to raise the money for it. I think one of the key findings of the previous administration was that as long as healthcare spending grows faster than your tax base, you're going to have a significant headwind in funding a single payer system. And so I think the previous administration said, what problem can we solve now, which led to creating a, a model for a more integrated system of care. And so the all payer model was what was available as the next step. We got up that problem that it cost too much. And to try to better align the overall trajectory of healthcare spending with overall economic growth, while not compromising Vermont's traditionally high quality healthcare. And so that's, that's the path we're on now. Um, and have been pursuing, you know, there are only two real ways to go at healthcare reform. One's competition and one's integration. And, and Vermont is all in on collaboration through the all pair model. And, and that's where we find ourselves. Okay, and I'm gonna just try to weave some things together as we some of our testimony, like when we, if you think back to our testimony from Professor Jessica Holmes in terms of Healthcare economics 101, as you say, the conclusion was that competition wasn't going to get us there. Mm -hmm. And but we needed to have, we needed to, and that's the basic, one of the basic premises that she was sharing in terms of her analysis of healthcare economics is that healthcare is not, healthcare is not susceptible to the typical competitive marketplace. So how to get to a place of uh, lowering costs an alternative, and the alternative that this represents is how to integrate care and how to work with federal partners through the Center for Medicaid and Medicare and Medicaid Services to provide waivers from some of the requirements of federal law that would allow us to do some things which otherwise would not be permitted under federal law. Is that fair to say? That, that's 100% fair to say. And so that's, I think it's, uh, I've been trying to think about how to tease out and articulate <coughs> some of how we are, where we are, mm -hmm. without getting, before we get too far into yes. all the detail. Yeah, yeah. And if you, if you return to uh, Elliot Fishman's original who is, he's the, was known as the father of the Accountable Care Organization, and he is a, a professor at Dartmouth. Um, and if you, he, if you go back to where he kind of originally envisioned Accountable Care Organization, they were, they really looked in some ways more like Vermont's Accountable Care Organization network looks today, which is an accountable neighborhood a large continuum of care providers that are sharing accountability for the quality and cost of health outcomes. We have a short video that we'll show in a short while here that looks at how the federal government um, articulated through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Accountable Care Organizations and they tended to be a little more medically focused in the traditional medical care continuum and not as broad as uh, of an accountable care organization uh, neighborhood concept as we see here in Vermont today. And I think that's important to appreciate because the idea behind the accountable care organization is that providers are coming together in a network to be mutually accountable for the population that they share care for. And some of that quote coming together in integration would run afoul of federal law. Correct. And I think these are these are key important pieces that this is the waiver, the federal waiver is what allows Vermont to, to do some things which otherwise would be seen as uh, illegal. Uh, it's, the, it's the innovation center that really can facilitate these models. And that's where the, the Innovation Center has its particular power, the Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Center, which was created by the Affordable Care Act in order to allow for the federal government to test payment models, alternative payment models, specifically ones where providers were cooperating and integrated without having um, to have those payment models approved by Congress. 
my idea of question. Um, it's still relevant. It, it is, yeah, and I think it's, so I just want to put out there the way that I am thinking about Act 48 and about um, ACOs. And um, Act 48 um, was, um, as the chair mentioned, had five uh, principles in it of uh, human rights principles, transparency, accountability, equity, participation. I always forget one, um, equity, anyway. Um, they're all critically important. Um, and I, so when hearing about the accountable care organization, I think it's important to continue to mm -hmm. remember what the what all of us that worked um, towards the passage of Act um, 48 in 2011 were hoping for. Um, and I do believe, as a person who works in the healthcare system at the bedside, I do believe that there are benefits for accountable care organizations. But um, I also want to keep. Um, I, I do keep in mind that, um, for example, the slide that says the problem we are trying to solve um, is to increase access to insurance for people who need it most. Um, I would say the problem we are trying to solve is to improve uh, to increase access to health care, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily insurance. And for, you know, in this time that we're in now, yes, it would include um, increasing access to insurance. So there's different fundamental there's fundamental differences between the intent and the of Act I believe of Act 48 um, and of the ACOs. And again, as someone who practices in the healthcare system, I have noticed benefits of accountable care organizations. And um, as I continue to work in this role um, and listen to testimony, I am going to be concerned about those five <coughs> principles mm -hmm. that include accountability um, and transparency and participation in particular. And I know the Green Mountain Care Board has oversight, um, but um, let's, let's in what meaningful way? Um, <coughs> that because the ACO is actually has major control over um, public, state, and federal funds. And as we I appreciate that comment because as, as we worked through the process of going through the two years of negotiation to see like what would an accountable care organization model look like for Vermont if Vermont were to create an agreement with the federal government that allowed Medicare to participate on Vermont's terms and in, in those two years we kept the legislature updated about that progress and what that program could potentially look like and we shared term sheet proposals and um, framework for the program and upon seeing that this this committee uh, felt that it was important that the legislature grant authority for the state to enter into this agreement only if the agreement was consistent with the principles of Act 48 and so that was that's there here on this slide um, and then it also, in that same legislation, did require the oversight of the Green Mountain Care Board, which, which Mike can elaborate on here as well. Thank you. And so, so I'm just going to add, add as well that we, we, we may not be done with holding, there may be other initiatives that outside entities or individuals or members want to propose that enhance accountability, enhance transparency, enhance the principles of Act 48 as we're going forward. And those, we, we may take up some of those propo proposals and we may implement some of those proposals or pass some of those proposals, but they're not, but they're proposals that are trying to work within the framework of Act 48 and within the framework of the waiver proposal, which is the policy of the state of Vermont currently. It's not, it's not a question of shall we have this policy or shall we not have this, shall we move forward with this reform at this point in time or not. Uh, I mean, if we, if we wanted to entertain that question, that's a very, very large question. Currently, I guess I'm just wanting to say currently, the all-payer model agreement 
which we said must be consistent with the principles of Act 48, uh, is, what, is how we're moving forward uh, in an agreement between the legislature, the executive branch, um, to, to, to try to, to try through these processes, reduce and impact the cost of health care. Yes. And we're not, we're not there yet. We're very much in the process. This is like, this is, we have, it's not like we have a finished product. We are very much, in some ways, even at the beginning or the midpoint of a process. So that's, that's what's, I think, time's confusing. Yes. January 2019 marks performance year two of an agreement that contains five performance years. So we're in the beginning, I think probably technically we're in the beginning of the of, of implementing this agreement. And the agreement um, is between Vermont and the federal government, our partners at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. The agreement includes uh, signatories from the state of Vermont, the, the governor, the secretary of the Agency of Human Services, and the chair of the Green Medicare Board. The agreement allows for Medicare to participate in Vermont on, on Vermont's terms in many ways uh, in an alternative payment model and allow for Medicare to pay uh, accountable care organizations in Vermont in a way that is aligned with other payers participating in Vermont. That is the, that is the chief, that is the chief advantage to our state that this agreement allows for us is Medicare to participate by Vermont's terms. Uh, and that, to put it in really, really layman's terms, it's a big deal. <laughs> you, can't, you can't just decide that we're going to do this and have Medicare participate. Medicare is a federal program. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are those who, in other states, in fact, in conversations I've been part of over in just the last few days, there, there are other states are going, how did you get to do this? Mm -hmm. how, how are you getting to do this in Vermont? This is not something that just happens. And so we've yet to see if, they, if this is going to have the full impact that we're, that the hopes that were set out, but that is, that is part of the framework that was negotiated and was a significant part of the negotiation that meant that we, in fact, in Vermont, could involve Medicare mm -hmm. as a part of this uh, new model. That's right. And in, in addition to Medicare's participation in the model and in paying differently, and Medicare has been paying fee-for-service since 1965, and it's paying in a radically different way in Vermont and in one other place that has an accountable care organization that is receiving fixed prospective payments. So it is, it is a very big deal in terms of shifting the paradigm in our health care system. Medicare through this agreement is also, um, we, were able to, we were able to secure funds for Medicare to continue to participate in Vermont's blueprint for health and that is through the accountable care organization as, as the mechanism for funding that ongoing investment. And that's, that was another important <coughs> principle that we held very tightly as we were working through the negotiation because we believe that in a system that is uh, shifting the incentives and emphasizing um, well care rather than sick care, that preserving our patient-centered medical home program was extremely important. So we got ahead of ourselves in terms of scheduling our <coughs> standards. I'm thinking about it now. We haven't really talked about the blueprint for health. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, this is maybe unfair on a 10 second notice. Um, is there somebody, <coughs> would, would either Ina or Michael be willing to kind of just do a brief <coughs> synopsis of what the blueprint for health entails? Sure. In, yeah. in, in a way that can be easily digested because it's a piece of what Vermont has been undertaking for some period of years now. And mm -hmm. you're saying we wanted to maintain it, but what is it? We wanted to maintain Medicare's participation Medicare. in it right. specifically. Okay. That's, that's what you were saying, yeah. And, and it, it is a part of the Department of Vermont Health Access. So I think it's appropriate for Michael to describe it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at a very high level, uh, Blueprint for Health sits in the Department of Vermont Health Access. 
Uh, it is the innovation, all payer innovation arm of healthcare in Vermont. Um, it's an overly bureaucratic way of saying yeah, that. <laughs> what the hell is that? So, I'm sorry. Yeah. What? <laughs> so, long story short. Um, Love you, Michael. About 13 years ago, people came together and said, hey, healthcare is broken, we need to do something about it. And there needed to be a spot to work on actual payment and delivery system reform. Can we change the incentives for how people care for people through different payments? And can we create a learning collaborative uh, where people can learn how to care for people in a different way? Over the last 13 years, Blueprint has basically created a network of every primary, just about every primary care office in Vermont um, and offered them supports through community health teams uh, and other learning opportunities and a whole bunch of per member per month payments to try to try things differently. <coughs> and they've come up with things like the Women's Health Initiative, um, Hub and Spoke, just a variety of ways to get practitioners to think differently about how to care for people. And the way that I kind of explain this about, hey, the blueprint and the ACO, is the blueprint's like the phone. It's the operating system for healthcare reform in Vermont. It's a bunch of practitioners that listen to each other and work together. And the Blueprint provided them with all sorts of data about their practice that they didn't have before. Uh, and then the ACO is kind of like an app on that phone. It's trying to take those relationships and work harder and faster on them. And like one big difference is Blueprint provides practice level data. Hey, we noticed that 10% of your practice has a big problem with diabetes. Let's work together on that. Whereas the ACO provides that same type of information, but on a member by member. And, and so I've come to believe through my two years at Diva that there's something really special about the blueprint and it's way more effective than the sum of its parts because it is, if you have a good idea, you can drop it into this network and basically get a whole bunch of primary care docs working together in a different way and working together on things that are usually a little bit outside normal primary care, mental health, substance abuse, et cetera. But it's just a fancy word for the level of collaboration that exists among primary care docs, and Medicare participates in that with some payments, and the all-payer model, one of the big negotiation and logistical challenges was making sure that Medicare still paid into it. And we made the argument to them that it would be a very funny time to stop paying into it, <coughs> and we're about to really go after primary care-based healthcare reform. And part of, part of the blueprint, is, this is, as I understand it, correct me, the part of the goal of the blueprint was to have virtually all Vermonters have a medical home. Yep. It's a term which we get, you get thrown around here. It's basically that means everybody has a primary care physician, which is the place, the, the focus of where they would be able to go to seek other services, to where there would be an ongoing understanding of what their care is and hasn't been. Uh, and that that's a part of what the Blueprint for Health has been working toward achieving. And, and in fact, oh, oh, I apologize, but in, in fact, the, uh, the technical way in which the money was paid to us is taking what used to be called the Multi-Payer Advanced Primary Care Practice Project. Demonstration. Basically, demonstration, oh, that, thank you. Yeah. That cures it up. Was but that, that, that was, that was, was the, program, uh, right? yeah federal program that allowed Medicare to pay into primary care practices in Vermont. So Medicare and private insurers and Medicaid would do that together. Um, and we said to them, hey, you need to maintain that funding as we go into ACO-based reform. And so, the Blueprint has, I think, the very unique and important about the Blueprint is it has these things called community health teams. And the community health teams support the patients that are in medical homes, and they provide connections from your patient-centered medical home to other services. And it varies by community, but those community health teams um, are, are a critical component in, in facilitating um, connections to uh, nutrition services, to, um, in some places, even economic services, um, facilitating connections to chronic disease self-management programs things of that nature. So to kind of bring us back, part of what you were starting to say was that when I said, oh, well, tell us what the blueprint is, uh, is that part of the negotiation with the federal government around this large waiver that allowed us to include Medicare 
payments mm -hmm. was that we're already doing some of this in, so, in a significant way in Vermont through what we call the blueprint for health. Let's not, let's make sure that this builds on that right. rather than become something separate from it and it gets to build on the blueprint right. work. Yeah. Which would, and I really do want us to hear from folks of the, who are working mm -hmm. at the, the clinical level with the blueprint now, because it's... But the one observation I would have that I think is helpful at this point in time is that I feel like the public policy conversation about this has mirrored the internal DEVA business conversation about this. When we started working with an accountable care organization, our team said, well, if the ACO is now working in this field, we're going to get out of this field. And we've said to them, no, 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 no. This is about collaboration. And so same in public policy. I think when the, the all-parent model's first analysis, they said, well, the ACO and the blueprint are double parts. And we responded to people, no, we envision a strong collaboration that builds on Vermont's foundation of healthcare reform. It's both and, not either or. And that's been a real struggle to tell that story and make it work. But that was very much a part of what led us to have a yes. successful negotiation was Vermont had this infrastructure, something that it could build on as risk for total cost of care was shifted to providers. What tools did providers in Vermont have to be able to, uh, to, to promote um, better health for their patients? and live under that target. Can I name what I think is one of the challenges in Vermonters understanding all this? I mean, maybe us, to start with us, and then Vermonters generally. I think the blueprint is pretty much invisible to Vermonters. I don't think most Vermonters could say, I just, my physician participates in the blueprint for health. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't think it's the case. And yet, as you say, many or most Vermonters who are seeing a family physician, your family physician is actually a participant in this piece of reform work around healthcare in Vermont. And they're receiving actually some payments to facilitate them participate. But I can tell you, I have never once heard my family physician say anything to me about the blueprint for health. Now maybe that's entirely appropriate. But I think a lot when we start to explain what's being put in motion in Vermont, I think there are certain aspects of it that, because they're not visible mm -hmm. to the average Vermonter, when we start talking about it, it's like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I didn't, I'm, am I part of that? And I think that's, and I'm going to just name that as a challenge, which I think is an ongoing challenge for some of us as we look at other parts of the all-payer model and the parts of the ACO. Mm -hmm. Like if, if the person themselves doesn't know in some way that their health care is impacted or participating or benefiting from some of this, this all seems like foreign, mm -hmm. like a foreign piece of that. I've already been wanting to say I, would. I just have a quick clarification question. So in your explanation of the blueprint, you said the blueprint shares um, data practice level data and the OCO, ACO does member level data. What is the difference between a practice and a member? So um, the blueprint, uh, so the chairman's point, uh, is in 137 of 149 primary care practices. And they might say to, you know, let's call it Shelburne Pediatrics, hi, do you, do you, know, um, you know you have a panel of 2,000 kids? Uh, you should know that the data tells us that a quarter of them are at risk for obesity. We should think really hard about strategies to work on obesity in those kids. Whereas my understanding of the ACO program is that that's say, what you just described is the blueprint. The blueprint, the blueprint, the blueprint is historically okay. enabled care through that type of data. Uh, and on the ACO, it gets more to instead of those 500 kids out of 2,000 more, I, you know, we're responsible for the total cost of care of John Smith or Jamie Smith. Okay. Um, where our risk stratific our tools tell us that John or Jamie might be at risk for this, you might think about these specific strategies for John and Jamie. Yeah, I, I don't. I want to make sure the ACO speaks for itself. That's the distinction that we think about um, as a payer into that program. Okay. And, and to that point, we did have everybody go around and introduce themselves, which I might still do maybe after the after we take a break. Is there anyone in the room here from OneCare? 
<laughs> okay, great, because I think it's, yeah, I was trusting that someone from one care would be in the room for this conversation and I'll work. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Woody. I was, I was just going to ask a question. And Woody, you're going to speak up just a little bit because I'm not sure everyone in the room okay. can hear you. I was just going to ask a question. You, you asked it. Okay. Um, ask it again. <laughs> not knowing what the blueprint is. Why do I care if, if, if I have my own insurance, my own private insurance company, why do I care? I think it's a pretty good question. Is that something? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless it affects me financially. I mean, or from your clinical care. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you would care about that. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, so, I mean, I could take a shot at it, just in terms of the example that was just given. If, you, if you're seeing a primary care physician, and um, so I don't know the examples of the, all the things that the blueprint are working with, but let's say you're not Woody of your certain age and certain gender, but that you were a younger person or that fit into a panel of what you were talking about and were at risk for obesity, uh, the blueprint would be taking your primary care physician's information and saying, there's a, there's a way within your family practice that care could actually be improved for some numbers of your patients based on the, our analysis of this data that, we, that you've provided and we've been collecting. And I think for some uh, family practices, part of what has been suggested is that simply knowing that kind, like most, most practices don't analyze that kind of data on a routine basis. Um, and that sometimes simply knowing that there's this disparity within a certain part of your um, patient care, your, like people call them panels, but that doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. But that, that then, then you're able to think about how to tailor some additional, and then next time say you come in and you're, you fall within that percentage, that might actually provide them with a more opportunity to provide uh, an intervention for you. But if my primary care physician is up on things, why does he need a blueprint to, uh, to show him the way for my health? I, I think, Mr. Chairman, that of course would be instructive to have those primary care docs speak to this. Um, what we are told is that... Very good that question. I, I don't know. It's a very good question, Woody. I the, think it's a very good question. The two ways in which we think of it are one, the same way as the chair, that this is going to enable better clinical practice, and be able to distribute models of health care for the right people at the right time. And then the blueprint evaluations over time have indicated that if you give the right care at the right time, uh, you reduce the overall utilization of health care services, which keeps costs down for your insurer or your employer. And, and can reduce hospital admissions as well, which is, in, I mean, I don't think any one of us looks forward to a hospital admission. And so the, that's, the, that's the, when the blueprint, we'll have the blueprint talk to us more about, and I think your questions are dead on. Right? Are you talking about tweaking something that already exists? As far as what Woody was saying, uh, something, is there something that's already in a program that the that your general care uh, doctor doesn't recognize or realize? Or? I, I think um, if you're one of the other states that is talking to the chair about health policy, one of the things that you probably need for this model to work is a well, um, a really strong network of primary care doctors that are used to working together. And one of the advantages in Vermont is that we did not need to invent that. It already existed because of the blueprint for So I think, so I think what you're saying, Brian, is right on. Yes. It's tweaking the, the all-payer model, to make the connection now here. Yeah. The all-payer model agreement is actually, in part, a way of tweaking, but significantly, but tweaking something which had already been put in place in Vermont, and that's the blueprint for health. Okay. So it's a and, okay. and, and, it's, and I'm, I'm trying to, and I'm going to turn to you all, because I, I don't have the kind of detailed examples, but People sometimes refer to the blueprint as the chronic care. How, for those of us who have chronic health conditions, Woody, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes 
understanding how to work with people with chronic conditions. It's not like second guessing your family physician or saying they don't know what they're doing, but it's it's like how to uh, how to in, with a broader mm -hmm. picture understand what are some of the things that are, we're learning that could be done uh, to help prevent you from to to help intervene for your specific health and the health of the whole practice uh, with the goal that fewer times would you get admitted to the hospital because there'd be an earlier intervention that would be done. And not by telling the doctor you don't know what you're doing, but by saying, but by saying, hey, what about this? Have you thought broadly about this? And, uh, and there's, there's, there's research that shows that, and I was, one of the thing, other things I've learned in this committee is there's research that shows that physicians by and large want to, they want to do the best you know, of course they want to do the best for their patients. And where there's, when they give, are given data or information that there, something going on in their practice is an outlier, they immediately try to figure out how to bring it in line. Because that, and that's true for, in a lot of different parts of healthcare, rather than, you know, One example that I think could be helpful <coughs> in how the blueprint works is the, some primary care providers have chosen to become spokes, and spokes are primary care providers that are, are providing for medication-assisted treatment for their patients. And in for, fee, for substance use if, if their patients are, are substance use, uh, are opioid dependent specifically. And that's something that's changed over time, the number of people who are opioid dependent, and that's something that wasn't always in the scope of practice for primary care physicians. And the blueprint supports those primary care physicians, physicians, excuse me, in providing uh, nurse assistance and and the community health team that works with the the patients who are receiving medic, medically uh, medication assisted treatment for opioid dependence. I think that's one way that medicine has evolved over time, and the blueprint is stepping in to help primary care practitioners in the state. Just kind of push it back. Like one thing that really helped me with blue print is really talking to the doctors because it really is an operations thing and understanding how this work, how they're utilizing it, and how they're using these resources. I think with all payer, it really is more like that. There is the care management piece of it, but I think the whole operations is more of a financial and a risk management, which I think might help provide how we're financing well, and then we can talk to blueprint another day with people on the ground that may be utilizing the system. Yeah. And, and no, that's helpful. I think that's helpful, Ben, because it's because this is talking more about the financial the incentives to change the incentives for for care from fee for service to the more structural stuff, which I think is very important. And then you can delve into the care and I would just say briefly, I think Representative Smith's um, point is a really good one. I mean, where you sit determines what you see. When we were negotiating with the federal government about this, they said to us. Hey, one, we only want to partner with people who can do things we can't do. And two, we don't want to give you risk you can't handle. The blueprint for health is already an existing multi-payer primary care collaborative. We don't have that other places. You can do something we can't do. And the fact you've been doing this for a decade means that we think you can handle primary you, care. You being Vermont. You being Vermont can handle primary care-based innovation, because we're going to pay you in a different way with Medicare, which is a really big deal. And we want to, if we're going to do that for the first time ever, we're going to make sure the state that we deal with can probably handle this. And so understanding, to Representative Jickling's point, the true operations, the blueprint's important, because it's about how primary care gets done on a daily basis all across Vermont. And the ACO tweaks that and builds on top of that. It's not a wholly new thing. It's more of incremental improvement rather than some revolution in how we do things. Well, like tweaking without spending additional money that you don't need to spend. Mm -hmm. Did I just make sense or not? Well, we are spending some additional yeah. money, but spending just the additional money that makes sense in terms of what we're trying to achieve, like the tweaking that we're trying to put in motion. Okay. I, think that, I think that was a really helpful point. And the model is, Specifically, the, the test of this model is if you change the incentives 
uh, will there be delivery system changes that allow you to, to live under a new, a new financing structure? So the model doesn't work unless there is delivery system reform and delivery system change. But that change is incentivized by the payment change. So specifically, the model allows for there to be contracts between payers and, and an accountable care organization. In this case, in Vermont, it's One Care Vermont. That's the accountable care organization. And the payers are the three types of payers. The three major payer major groups. Payers, <coughs> major payer groups. Yes. So, and Medicare and Medicaid are each their own payer, but commercial is a group. Yeah. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shoes, MVP. Yes. City yes. And, and so through the model, Medicare has a contract with the accountable care organization. And it's actually through that contract where the waivers are granted. Vermont doesn't have any waivers as a state. The accountable care organization has waivers via that contract with Medicare. It's, it's a technical distinction, but it's an important <coughs> one. Those waivers allow for there to be um, changes in how telehealth is offered, uh, changes to the uh, skilled nursing facility, um, and uh, additionally uh, allows for a home visit um, for persons who have been discharged without uh, the homebound requirement for that visit. The Medicaid program has its own contract with the accountable care organization, and commercial participating commercial payers have contracts with the accountable care organization. And all of those contracts are looked at by the Green Mountain Care Board, and the Green Mountain Care Board youth is required to assess how they align. Are there, are there uh, alignments in, in the paying payer mechanism? Um, are there alignments for quality measures across those three groups of contracts? And then uh, the accountable care organization then uh, has a network of providers that it works with. The accountable care organization is paid, and this is at a very basic high level, it, is, it receives the alternative payment and then provides for that um, in their uh, participating network of providers. Michael and Alicia and Mike may talk about how that works differently by different payers and have some of the variations to that. It's not as straightforward as simply um, an alternative payment to the ACO, but I'll let them get into those details. Does it make sense to review a quick video about accountable care organizations? We, we did this with your committee last year. Good. Okay. Great. And then maybe after we see the video, maybe there's questions after the video, and then maybe we'll take a break. Yes, that sounds great. Can you hear it? <laughs> you might want to put the microphone on. Yeah. Well, that's it. Can you put your mic near the speaker? Does the it mic? It won't actually affect our experience. Um, I'm not sure how. I think the microphone just leads to the microphone. It just records our microphone. Yeah. So you can see it, right? Yeah, we got sound through this thing. Does it have a closed caption on it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. The Affordable Care Act isn't just a new way to get health insurance. It also ushers in a new approach to care. Meet the ACO. An accountable care organization is a network of doctors and hospitals that shares financial and medical responsibility for patients. The goal is to coordinate care and eliminate unnecessary spending. Medicare set these up around the country, and private insurers have too. In the health system today, patients are usually responsible for coordinating their own medical care. Someone with heart disease may see a primary care doctor, a cardiologist, and maybe even a heart surgeon. But the doctors might not talk much, so they could order repetitive tests or prescribe conflicting drugs. That isn't good for the patient, and it's expensive. It's also not the way things work in most other industries. Imagine your 
car won't start. Now imagine that to fix it, you had to schlep to the transmission whisperer, the battery baron, the timing belt tycoon, and the piston professional. Each would only look at their piece of the car and not think about how the parts work together. That makes no sense. Instead, you go to an auto garage where an organized crew works together to make your car run again. An ACO brings that kind of coordination to your medical care. Your doctors, imaging specialists, surgeons, hospitals all work together and share information to figure out the best way to fix you up and keep you healthy afterwards. What's in it for the ACOs? ACOs that save Medicare money get to keep a portion of that savings if the doctors and hospitals can show they're doing a good job keeping people healthier. So, are ACOs working? Well, the jury's still out. It's unclear how much money ACOs save, and some organizations that try to form ACOs have quit. There are also concerns that ACOs could reduce competition and lead to higher prices. Wait a minute, how is this different from an HMO? ACOs have been accused of being health maintenance organizations in disguise. Both depend a lot on a primary care doctor who coordinates care. But there are some major differences. Patients in HMOs are covered only when they see doctors that are part of the HMO. In a Medicare ACO, patients can also see doctors outside the ACO. Shouldn't we worry that an ACO can save money by cutting corners? ACOs get graded on a list of quality measures to make sure no one skimps on care people need. These measures don't yet track all aspects of care, but the goal is to give ACOs financial incentives to keep people healthy instead of just treating them once they're sick. Want to learn more? Go to the address on the screen. So before we take a break, I want to make two, two points that I think would be helpful. First, um, one care, as I said before, one care's network is larger than <coughs> doctors and hospitals. It includes a broader continuum of care. I'm not exactly sure if I could get back to my slides or not, but um, I will do my best because I have an illustration of that. Um, and second, in the summertime, Medicare published its first results on the Next Generation ACO program. So there was a cohort of Next Generation ACOs that began in 2016. So Vermont's not included in that cohort. And they found that those ACOs that were taking on risk, uh, that they did generate savings for the Medicare program. And that's a difference between those ACOs that were participating in the shared savings program and the next generation program where there's significantly more risk shifted onto providers and along with that more flexibility in how they deliver care. So I wanted to provide that those two points um, after the video and prior to our break. Um, I, you have the findings at a glance from the next generation program. Um, and then here's an illustration of the types of providers that are in one CARES network, which I also thought would be helpful. So Lucy, I think you had a question somewhere along the way. Yeah, I have two questions. Okay, a couple questions. Then um, Mary, and then, but let me just suggest we're not going to try to understand all of one care right now. I think you should learn and so definitely just, hear from this. one care. Yeah, yeah, you're probably hearing from one care. But I'm just saying, just as a preemptive to the Let's hear your question, too. My first question was, you were saying about the ACO having waivers as opposed to the state of Vermont having waivers. Is that any ACO in Vermont or specifically one care? So if another ACO were to form in Vermont, would they have to go through the entire process all over again of getting waivers? Or? That's a great question. One care through its ag agreement with um, the federal government and now they're not actually operating as a um, as a next generation ACO. They're operating as a Vermont Medicare ACO initiative ACO, and so they have a contract directly with CMMI. And through that contract, that's where they can avail themselves of those waiver opportunities. Those, but they are available to other next generation ACOs. If there were other ACOs in Vermont that wanted to participate in this program, they would simply. Um, 
well, not, it's probably not simple. They would need to be <laughs> certified by the Green Mountain Care Board. They would need to participate, you know, indicate that they were wanting to participate in the all payer program. And then they would need to meet those requirements. And then they, through a contract with Medicare, would have um, this alternative arrangement. But no, we wouldn't have to negotiate a new model. When we negotiated the model, we didn't know there would be one ACO. We didn't know there would be 10 ACOs. So would they, so if a new ACO were to form, with the waivers, was that something that happened with the, at the point of the model negotiation? Or was that something that one care went through specifically when they were forming? The federal government is offering these waivers through <coughs> the Next Generation program, regardless of Vermont's model. However, Vermont's model allows these next generation waivers to be incorporated into our programs as well. Um, and then my other question was the video, and then I've also heard you reference the evidence for the ACO being the lack of communication between, or the, the need for the ACO being the lack of communication between different types of doctors and different people providing care for a patient. What, evidence do we have in Vermont of the lack of communication? Like how do we, do we know that in Vermont our doctors are not communicating well already or compared to other states, do we know how we're at with that or yeah, mm -hmm. how do we know that there is a need in that way? That's a really good question. I think that um, how we experience care as individuals may um, give us that evidence to a degree. I certainly have experienced some care myself that I wish was better coordinated yeah. <laughs> and where I wish I hadn't had to be the middle person. Um, but how we compare on that to other states is a question I'm not sure I have the answer to. I only ask because my experience has been, you know, like I just feel like anecdotal evidence is not that helpful maybe in this mm -hmm. case because my experience has been having great experiences mm -hmm. with coordinated care between mm -hmm. my primary care physicians and I'm sure everybody has a different mm -hmm. realm, so I was just curious if there was any sort of a measure or how we know the background on the Well, people. Vermont has, a, we also have talked about, and this committee has heard about, I, I believe, how, how well Vermont's healthcare system does perform. So I think Vermont's healthcare system is a very high performing system and we have a lot to be very proud of here with many good outcomes. At the same time, where we rank top in the nation for our outcomes, we're still ranking you know, in the middle, lower end of the pack with other developed nations on our outcomes, so we know that there's still room for improvement. Yeah. That makes sense. I, yeah, I don't want to monopolize. I think my, my only point is it just, it just seems like the effectiveness of the model would be dependent upon how effective we would be at the start of the model. So as, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like the more effective Vermont is to begin with, perhaps the less there is to improve through the model, which is why I was just curious where we were getting our information. That speaks to some of where our targets came from, which I think Mike will share more okay. after the break. Okay. But we have these high-level population health outcomes, <coughs> and those are places where Vermont, and those are specifically places where we're looking to improve through the model, and those are places where Vermont does not um, have as good of a, of a status and outcomes, such as reducing deaths due to suicide, reducing deaths due to drug overdose. I have a clarifying question, because I, I do want to be clear about it. I think it's important. Um, so the One Care is a private, for-profit entity that is um, using, man managing, having public state and federal money um, through through it. And the corollary question is, where else does this happen? One, One Care is a entity that's owned by two nonprofits that are the founding partners of One Care. In Massachusetts, there's an example. In Massachusetts, <coughs> where else is that? Massachusetts has a Medicaid <coughs> ACO program as well, um, where ACOs are working with the Massachusetts Medi Medicaid program to accept alternative payment. And so those are Medicaid public funds that are that are going <coughs> to those ACOs there. That's one quick example that I can think of. There are likely other Medicaid ACOs. 
be accountable to the ACO itself, though. I know the hospitals within the ACO are not for profit, but the accountable care organization itself mm -hmm. is that not for profit? It is not not for profit. But I, and that's a conversation I think that you should. You should explore that more with one care because I think that they would be best capable of talking about that. It's a question that. that some of us have raised previously as well, and I think it's, uh, but I think it's, it's not as simple as uh, the corporate structure being the shareholder structure of what we when we say for profit. It's a different, it's a different, uh, it's a different corporate structure. But I think that one that we should talk more about and will. And thank you. The Green Mountain Care Board also looks at that in their ACO certification mm -hmm. process. My understanding is that there was. Go ahead, speak up. Sorry. My, Michael Barber, um, yeah. Chief of Health Policy for the Green Mountain Care Board. And, um, you know, I, I do think that one care should speak to this when they come before you. But, um, you know, my understanding is there were some challenges to setting up uh, the ACO as a nonprofit because. Uh, Vermont law prohibits nonprofits from making distributions to to the providers, essentially, in this case. So they had to be set up as a limited liability company. Um, I just wanted to note that uh, while it, while the ACO is owned by uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock and the University of Vermont Medical Center, it's governed by uh, a group um, of 19 members, board of managers, that is representative of one cares broader network, so they've got independent primary care, uh, practice representation, skilled nursing facility, designated agencies, and so on. So that that is something we look at at the map care board and the certification, which I'll talk about. Okay. And we'll absolutely when we have one care for me, we'll talk about it as well. And, and I think there's some other uh, because that question was frankly the question I had. Uh, early on in trying to understand why would we be why would we be structuring this way and I, I'm not sure I can fully articulate it right now but there are there are reasons other than it's a for profit in order to generate profits uh, and I think that we you know, we would do we would serve ourselves well and then by having them speak to it but also for us to ask the questions so that we understand what, what the structure is and all so I'm going to suggest that we do take our break right now. Uh, and um, <coughs> how about we, let's, let's, let's come back at, we're going to go to, let's, let's take a break to the corner up. I think we need a, we need a good strip. Right. Okay. And, and, I would start that. Okay, Brian, we got the door. I started out with the door. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> so before we get started again with our next witness, I would like to invite or um, ask to those who are in the room, around the room, uh, to just do a quick go around and introduce yourself by name and if you're here <laughs> representing a particular group, uh, that's useful for me to know as a chair just in terms of the resource and also who's interested in what we're up to today. Um, so let's, let's do that. We'll just Good afternoon, Michael Costa, Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, Maddie Champagne, legislative intern. And there's Dale Hackett, consumer, grandpa three, dad of three. <coughs> so Dale, I'm going to suggest you go Dale Hackett, consumer rather than just Dale Hackett, consumer. Maybe you should oh, claim it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I hope I'm not embarrassing you too much because you, you're in here a lot. No. Okay. Like, claim your role. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank Good you. Good to Matt Swenson, Board of Media. Hi, Alicia Cooper, Department of Vermont Health Access. Hi, I'm Melissa Lyles, the Green Mountain Care Board. Ingrid Malmgren, the Grassin Group, representing some nonprofit healthcare organizations. Such as? Um, UVM Health Network. Uh, let me see. Oh, I'm spacing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, that's a start. Yeah, that's the main one. Yeah, I'm feeling that's a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Mike Fisher, Healthcare Advocate. 
Uh, I'm the infamous Walter Carpenter. I'm with Vermont Healthcare for All. And this committee room has been my set, my winter vacation home for about 10 years now. Since that 48 days. Winter vacation home right here. <laughs> Ian Beckett, the Agency of Human Services. I'm Meredith Roberts, American Nurses Association of Vermont. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Susan Aronoff, the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council, and I just want to point out that while we're a state agency and I am a state employee, the Developmental Disabilities Council is unique. Every state has one. We're entirely federally funded, no state dollars and any kind of support sometimes. And um, we're supposed to represent the consumer and family voice, so people with developmental disabilities and their family members. And we have a lot of interest in what's happening in healthcare reform, especially Medicaid. Thank you. Laura Pelosi, I represent a number of providers who participate in the all-payer model and ACO, uh, the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, the Vermont Healthcare Association, which is your skilled nursing facilities, and also the Ada Home Health. Lucy Guillermo, Downs Franklin Martin, uh, represent One Care Vermont, uh, the home health agents, uh, home health agencies, and also a number of hospitals, uh, Dartmouth, the Retreat, Springfield, Copley. Um, that's it. Okay, great. Amy for the Vermont Chiropractic Association. Great. Thank you. Exactly helpful. Appreciate it. So I think we're going to give the Microphone to uh, Mr. Barber. Thanks. Uh, for the record, Michael Barber, being on the care board. I'll try and speak up. I'm naturally talk pretty quietly. Um, so, Ina had uh, mentioned some of the benefits of the all payer ACO model in terms of Medicare's participation, some enhanced flexibility that comes with that, um, some Medicare benefit waivers that. Um, Medicare beneficiaries uh, can avail themselves of, as well as additional or continued blueprint funding. Um, I will maybe touch on those, but before I do, I wanted to get to kind of the accountability that comes with that flexibility and Medicare participation. Um, so the requirements on the state and the all-payer ACO model agreement. Um, so this slide tries to tries to summarize it very generally. Um, in the box on the left, you'll see that uh, the agreement includes both cost and quality targets. Uh, with respect to costs, there are targets for the amount that spending on certain services will grow, both for Medicare um, and all payer beneficiaries. All payer <coughs> beneficiaries includes most Vermonters. Vermonters with insurance. With respect to quality, the state is responsible for meeting targets on 20 different quality measures, which um, tie to three overarching population health goals for the state, uh, improving access to primary care, reducing deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and reducing the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease. Um, I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit more in depth in a minute. And then moving to the the box on the right, uh, the state is also responsible for ensuring that ACO programs in Vermont, uh, so Medicare, Medicaid program, commercial programs are aligned with one another in certain key areas. And finally, the state is responsible for, over the life of the agreement, um, steadily increasing the, the scale of the model or the number of people who are in the model. Both scale and alignment are important to ensuring that providers have strong, <coughs> consistent incentives to make changes that will reduce cost and improve quality. So basically, the, the goals on the right-hand side of this slide are important to achieving the, the goals on the left-hand side in terms of reducing cost and improving quality. So this next slide provides some more detail on the financial targets in the agreement. So for all payer beneficiaries, again, most Vermonters, uh, the target that the state is trying to achieve is a compound annual growth rate of 3.5%. Uh, 
which was intended to tie to the historic rate of growth in the state's gross domestic product. So try to bring spending on these services in line with, with the state average gross domestic product. Um, for Medicare beneficiaries, the target is a compounding annual growth rate of, of at least 0.2% less than the projected national Medicare growth. Um, so it's tied to projected national growth as opposed to actual national Medicare growth. That was important to the state so that the state would have uh, an idea of what the target is in advance. Um, performance on these financial targets is calculated over the five performance years of the agreement, with the baseline being 2017 spending. So because it's a compound annual growth rate, you know, it, it reduces some of the impact of volatility, so we could miss a year and still get our target um, because, because of the compound annual growth rate using that. Can I ask a question in terms of, you say the very top, the all-fair growth target of 3.5% or less. <coughs> what is what is captured within the all-payer growth target? I mean, what, 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 are, what, are we, what are we actually measuring? We're measuring spending on um, certain services. They are generally Medicare Part A and Part B type services, so your traditional Medicare services um, and their equivalents in Medicaid and commercial. Okay, so, so, again. So not pharmacy, not, not some other services, um, but, but a, a significant portion of, of health care spending. And are, we, and are we measuring what those services that are in each given year provided through the ACO, are we measuring all health care costs in the state of Vermont, regardless of whether provided through the ACO? So for the all-payer target, the 3.5% or less, that is all healthcare spending, regardless of whether it's in the ACO, outside of the ACO. For Medicare, it's a little bit more complicated. So for the first two years of the agreement, we are only measuring and held responsible for uh, the growth within the ACO. And then um, depending on what our scale is in the third year, it, we could be responsible again for only ACO attributed for all Vermont Medicare beneficiaries, and then for years four and five, performance years four and five, on the Medicare target, it is all Vermont Medicare beneficiaries. Okay, can I just chirp up and say that when Mike said all, when we're measuring all spending, he still means all A and B type spending. He does not mean more than that ever. All, all what would be the equivalent of Part A and Part B? Yes. Medicare, did you say what A and Part, part A and Part B? We don't use that term. Yeah. Sort of, I mean, just in a general, broad general. Uh, part A is hospital, uh, hospital services, and Part B is your tra like traditional um, physician services, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just to, uh, to the point of that. Uh, in the system or not in the system, or in the network and not in the network. Earlier we saw some numbers about how, how many participating providers there were, doctors, practices, hospitals, and so forth. Um, and I think that there were 13 hospitals out of 14, if I remember correctly. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about what percentage of the population essentially is covered through the, this model or the provider, or the, uh, the network. If it's all right, uh, there's a slide later in the That's presentation fine. Yeah, where thank we you. Um, cover a scale, basically how many people are in the hall. Percentage-wise, I can get you actual numbers. Um, so uh, also wanted to note that the agreement provides some flexibility in terms of uh, unanticipated events, uh, such as changes in Medicare law or uh, localized health or economic shocks, things that might impact the state's performance on these measures can be taken into account. We had a sudden epidemic of some, of some type, which would throw the whole health care system into the disequilibrium. Right. Those kinds of things. Uh, and while these are the, the targets um, that I just mentioned, uh, there are also uh, corrective action triggers. Those triggers are, are when 
uh, basically CMS can point to us and say there's something wrong here. We need to. We'll never pay back money to the federal government. Like if we don't hit these targets, we, we'll never owe money back to them. But uh, if we go above the correction act, corrective action triggers, then we can uh, be required to submit a corrective action plan to them, saying how we're going to get back on track. So the corrective action trigger for the all payer beneficiaries is 4.3 percent compound annual growth rate, and um, for Medicare, the trigger is if compound annual growth exceeds national projections by 0.1 percent or more. To whom does the federal government speak? They, I mean, there's a three. There's like the we don't care board. There's the agency of administer or the agency of. Uh, <coughs> Human Thank you, Services. Human Services. Sorry. I had a very late lunch in the last five minutes, so I'm trying to get my brain back on track. Um, so there's the Agency Human Services, the Greenback Care Board, and the Governor's Office. All, all, they're all signatories to the agreement. Is there a point of, of responsibility in terms of the you know, CM, CMMS or whomever saying, uh, you exceeded your. There's a corrective action. Well, do they do they approach the Greenback Care Board? Do they approach the Agency Human Services, the Governor's Office, or someone? Um, you know? I'm not sure if there's a specific process set out in the agreement. It does uh, have some specifics about how a corrective action plan would be triggered. I don't have those memorized, but essentially, we we report the Green Mountain Care Board reports to CMS, and I'll get to this in a minute on all these measures. Um, and so that would be the initial point where we would identify that, hey, we're not, we're, we're above a corrective action trigger here. Um, and, and then we would need to work with all the signatories, AHS, government's office. What is the responsibility for Greenback Care Board to be uh, reporting to them? Because that's all I've never really asked that. Um, so the next slide uh, covers the quality framework in the agreement, which acts as a uh, check on the model's financial incentives to reduce cost. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, there are 20 measures the state is responsible for under the agreement. In negotiating these measures, the state um, advocated for ambitious but realistic targets on measures that address key state priorities. So pulling from the state health improvement plan, for example, uh, the state also considered collection burden, advocating for measures that were already being prioritized and collected in Vermont, as well as measures that relied to the greatest extent possible on claims data, so as to minimize the need for labor-intensive medical record. Um, so there are targets associated with each of the three population health outcomes. These, these outcome measures are measuring the health of all Vermonters, regardless of whether they're in the ACO or not. Um, and then supporting each of those high-level goals, there are healthcare delivery system targets that evaluate the ACO's performance and the quality of care received by people who are attributed to the ACO. These measures can be payer-specific, for example, just Medicare, or they could be multi-payer measures. And then there are a number of process milestones, which ensure that the state and the ACO, because these measures um, cover a broad range of, of issues that maybe the state, some of which should take hold on, uh, you know, are measuring whether the state and the ACO are doing things that will move the needle on the broader population health measure. So for example, one of the process milestones for reducing the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease is uh, achieving the 25th percentile as compared to health plans nationally for people, the number of people who are receiving asthma medication management, for example. So, build, so building from those up to the, the broader goals of the model. Somebody was interested in another time they could find more detail on all those measures. 
Yeah. Uh, not looking for a parent. Yeah. So <laughs> if you yeah, don't provide too much detail. No, I mean, but but you're saying that that level of detail is there. Because I would just mention, because the suicide suicide issue is an issue of great great concern and interest to many people who don't know anything about the all payer model and probably don't really care about the all payer model. <coughs> but they care about suicide in the world. And uh, there's going to be suicide prevention day, and there's going to be initiatives. And so I'm just, I, the link here is that this has to be one of the large population measures. That is part of this model. That people should know about, it, but may not. So the next slide um, shows the, the targets in the agreement for scale. Again, that's the number of people who are in the model who are attributed to an ACO that's in the model. Obviously, we only have one ACO at this point in time, but um, as you can see, they are fairly aggressive. They were developed with the idea that. The three ACOs then operating in the state would join to form one, which obviously did not happen. Um, but by the end of the by the end of the model, so performance year five, 2022, um, you know, for, for all payer beneficiaries, uh, the target is 70 percent, and for Medicare uh, scale target beneficiaries, it's 90 percent. So one of the questions that would be important to understand not necessarily at this moment, but it's like, where are we in the scale process? Uh, and if we're not at scale, are we, is, it, is it possible to get to scale? Give us lots of what's the steps to get there. Uh, there is a slide that uh, has our <coughs> performance to date and our expectation of where things might end up this year. It's not fine. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, one of the other requirements in the agreement is that we ensure that ACO programs operating in Vermont align to the extent possible on some key areas. Uh, I've tried to list those areas here. So attribution methodologies, uh, which are basically used to determine the people that the ACO is responsible for. Second, programs have to align in terms of the services the ACO will be responsible for the expenditures that will be included when determining how the ACO performed. Um, under the all-payer model, we want, we want the services the ACO is responsible to, for to align as much as possible with the services the state is responsible for under our all-payer model agreement. So again, part, part A and part B type services um, at a minimum. Third, Programs have to align in terms of quality measures the ACO will be responsible for. Um, we also want these quality measures to align as much as possible with, again, quality measures that the state is responsible for under the agreement. And then fourth, ACO programs have to align in terms of payment mechanisms or basically how the ACO and the ACO providers get, get paid and risk arrangements. So, Risk that the ACO has expenditures for the attributed population exceed its target, uh, or it doesn't meet its quality targets. Yeah, I'm just not clear. Uh, we're talking about alignment, but um, we're bringing an alignment between what? Between who and what? Or what and what? So, as Ina mentioned, there's a each of the payers. Um, contracts with the ACL on its own terms. They have written agreements, so there's a Medicare agreement with the ACO. Uh, Department of Vermont, Vermont Health Access has an agreement with the ACO for the Medicaid program. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has a, has a program for their qualified health plan uh, lives. So those agreements uh, are expected to align as much as possible with each other, with the Medicare program in particular. Okay, so provider would be paid roughly the same for providing a service no matter who the payer was? So, uh, so for, for, the, for the agreement, we're, um, we're talking about payment mechanisms, services, quality measures, payment amounts uh, is not what I see. Okay. Now that you pointed that out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is some reporting around payment differentials um, in, in the agreement, uh, which we're going to start working through soon here, but um, 
we're just talking about this, the mechanisms by which we're going to get So this next slide tries to say on one slide what the Green Mountain Peer Board uh, is responsible for in terms of the model. So the certified animal care organizations are responsible for reviewing, modifying, and approving ACO budgets. We actually set the um, financial target for the ACO in the Medicare program, subject to CMS's approval. We have that authority under the all payer model agreement. Under statute, we advise the Department of Mont Health Access on the Medicare ACO rates that uh, basically the Medicaid financial target for the ACO. We have the flexibility to negotiate changes to the Medicare ACO program um, to increase alignment with other programs. So if we wanted to make a change, for example, to attribution methodologies to align more closely with how DIVA does attribution in their Medicaid program. We can, for example, take that to CMS. We are responsible for tracking and reporting to CMS on uh, the cost, quality, and scale performance. So how are we doing on those measures, as well as how, how the programs align with one another. And then we are um, Trying, we have a number of other regulatory processes, which you've probably heard about, that we try to integrate as much as possible in service of the targets in the agreement. So I'll just briefly go over each of those areas. Um, the first of them being ACO certification. It's basically like licensure. An ACO has to be certified by the Green Mountain Care Board in order to receive payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance under the all-payer model or any other payment reform program or initiative. There are 16 uh, statutory requirements um, that the board has to ensure are being met. I didn't want to list them all, obviously, but they relate to things like ACO governance, um, the ability of the ACO to assume risk, the ACO's model of care, um, the ACO's quality improvement efforts and programs, uh, patient protections, provider payments, and the use of health information technology. In terms of process, there's an initial application uh, that an ACO submits to be certified, and then following initial certification, there's an annual basically review that happens to make sure that the ACO is continuing to meet all, all its requirements. <clears throat> the ACO budget process is also an annual process. Um, there are a number of statutory criteria the board has to consider here, in addition to the requirements of the all payer model agreement. The board's review of ACO budgets is uh, significantly broader than it is in the hospital context. For example, the board looks at um, you know, the ACO's financial targets across payers and how they relate to the um, financial targets in the agreement. As I noted earlier, the, the board actually sets the Medicare target subject to CMS's approval and advises um, on the Medicaid target. The board also reviews ACO's programs and investments for the upcoming year. So for example, um, OneCare uh, is funding supplemental payments uh, per member per month payments to <coughs> designated agencies, area agencies on aging and skilled nursing facilities under its complex care coordination program, basically paying those providers for coordinating care better for people who are um, in higher risk. And so that's obviously part of the spending at the ACO level. That's reviewed during the ACO budget process, things like that. Uh, the board also looks at the ACO's administrative expenses and then how it's managing the risk that it's taking on, uh, which could involve you know, 
does the ACO need a certain amount of reserves, any insurance, um, how much risk is it delegating to uh, providers, things like that. So the next couple slides um, I'll briefly talk about the, the reporting that the Green Mountain Care Board does to the federal government. So um, on the financial measure total cost of care, um, I think the thing to I think the thing to <laughs> I think the thing to point out here is that there's a significant delay between when services occur when claims are submitted, adjudicated, and paid, and when they actually show up in uh, the all-payer claims database that the board administers, and which is the source of this reporting. So it's about nine months or more. Um, so we're just now finishing our total cost of care analysis for the first quarter of 2018. We're going to be reporting on, on this quarterly to CMS with a, a final report on where 2018 spending ended up kind of at the end of the third quarter of this year. Is that, is that kind of delay considered a standard of care, or standard of practice rather than not standard of care? There, <coughs> I would say yes. I think that the standard is about six months for claims. Um, but there's some additional steps that we have to do so that the claims have to come into the database. We have to go to the vendor that helps us aggregate them and filter out stuff that we don't really care about and build these reports. So it, it sounds like a simple thing, figuring out how much care costs, but it's, it, it's a complicated specification. It's like 50 pages. How we're going to do this? Um, we have to get approved by the federal government. Um, yes. It just strikes me you're well into year two before you even know what happened in year one, and therefore you can't make that adjustment in year two because it's already gone by. But, I mean, that's oversimplifying, but uh, part of the challenge. This is county. Yeah, we just started our second performance year. But even though you're you're doing you're giving this report to CMS, can you extrapolate or can you get early readings towards the future? I mean, do you, you must have some kind of temporary uh, handle on things. Yes, we. So um, we have built total cost of care kind of analysis backwards. So we, like we, know, we know where 2017 ended up, for example. Um, for Medicare, it's, uh, like I said earlier, we are responsible for meeting national projections. So we know what the national projections are. So we know where we end, where we end up for Medicare. So it's not. I mean, all hope is not lost because of this delay. Um, it does make things challenging, for sure, but, um, but we, we have ways to do um, So the next slide is kind of a timeline for reporting on scale and alignment. Um, so we will be reporting to CMS on uh, scale and alignment for 2018, midway through this year. Um, that said, we do have uh, an idea of our scale performance. <clears throat> so as you can see, we did not get our scale targets for 2018. Estimating we are not going to hit them this year either, but um, I think you can see there that we're making significant progress in terms of scale, and actually our trajectory is just about right if you kind of do the math um, in terms of how much we were expected to grow. We're growing that much, but we started from a base that was too low, essentially. And it's in 
anticipation that we would reach the elevator by? Um, or are we going to have to ask for a revision? We may be required to implement, come up with and implement a corrective action plan uh, on scale. That's kind of the trigger there is if we miss uh, for two years. So it's looking like we're going to miss for two years. Um, but you know, there's a lot of work going on uh, that the ACO can talk about, about reaching out to payers, getting payers to engage in this, getting more providers in, maybe big strides in terms of getting more providers into the model. And that's the way you build scale is more providers, more payers. Well, this, this provides background to, for questions that we have one here as well. Anne Marie. I'll wait for one kid. Okay. <clears throat> and then this is the reporting schedule for uh, the quality and outcomes measures. So uh, these rely on four year claims and clinical data and won't be calculated until the end of the third quarter of this year. <clears throat> so I had mentioned the board's <coughs> efforts uh, at regulatory integration, so integrating all the different things that it does to try and achieve these targets. Uh, I think the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation was um, interested in pursuing this model with Vermont, largely because uh, the Green Mountain Care Board has some unique authorities. Um, so I tried to set those out here. Um, the boxes in green, ACO oversight, including budget review and certification, and the Medicare ACO program design and rate setting. Those are relatively new authorities that the board has as a result of Act 113 of 2016 and as, as a result of the elevator ACO model agreement. And then the, the boxes in blue, hospital budget review, health insurance rate review, and certificate of need are things that the board has done for number of years now and that were done before the board by uh, other agencies. <clears throat> and then the final slide is just trying to show that um, those regulatory levers that the board has operate uh, on different le levels. So hospital budget review uh, regulates hospital revenue, so spending on hospital services across all payers. Uh, health insurance rate review is obviously limited to commercial insurance. ACO budget review touches all payers to the extent that payers contracted with the ACO. Obviously, the importance of that lever will grow over time as scale increases. And then Medicare ACO rate setting only touches Medicare, Medicaid, ACO review device and touches uh, Medicaid. Will the Green Bank Care Board be making any recommendations for any modification to their authority to provide the ongoing oversight? Questions? Mike, Dave, sorry. Um, so just getting back to the scale, but actually if you could go back to one of those slides, I, I wanted to just get clarified for me anyway. You, you've broken out the, uh, Medicare from all payer. So th does the all payer include Medicare or is that all payer except for Medicare? All payer includes Okay, so the top the top line is the total population essentially we're trying, we're trying to get. Okay, um, then just thinking about where we are versus the targets, or where we are versus um, you know, 100 percent even. Who, who is responsible in the current structure for trying to increase those numbers? Is it the the ACO or other ACOs or some other entity? 
Um, I would say under the agreement, the state is responsible, but um, obviously primarily the ACO uh, has, um, it has to tell its story to providers and get if this is a voluntary model. Um, so it's got to make the case both to providers and payers that this is worth doing and um, come join with you and we can uh, provide value to you. So uh, I would say, and appropriately so, that the ACO should be the primary. I think the helpful perspective that we could begin to talk about today is, okay, based on the theory and regulatory structure that Ina and Michael Barber have described, we can talk about being on the ground and trying to make this work for Vermont and Vermonters at Medicaid and, and how, how that is going so far. Okay. All right. Um, Michael Costa, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Vermont Health Access, and I'm joined today by Alicia Cooper. Good, good afternoon. Alicia Cooper, Director of Payment Reform and Reimbursement for the Department of Vermont Health Access. Great. And so uh, we're going to both talk about this today uh, and very happy to answer whatever questions you may have. You're welcome to pull up another yeah. chair so you're sitting next to each other uh, that would be great. in front of each other. <laughs> Thanks. And so uh, having had the benefit of listening to the last several hours of testimony, I just want to start with a few comments that might seem obvious, but I hope are helpful. Number one, this stuff is hard. Uh, it is our great privilege at Medicaid to work on this each and every day, but for people that don't spend every day in it, it is really difficult stuff. So I, I think we expect this is going to be an ongoing dialogue for as long as healthcare reform persists here in Vermont. Um, two, I think it's important to recognize that the ACO is a means, not an end. It's a tool. The true goal is an integrated system of care that works from emergency rooms, from primary care uh, offices, through VNAs, to nursing homes, right? We want an integrated system of care that delivers the right care at the right time to the right person. Now, the reason why the all-payer model is special and why we're using the ACO so prominently as a tool in payment delivery system reform is that number one, it aligns with Medicare. And Medicare is the 800-pound gorilla in healthcare reform. And getting Medicare to align in a way that makes sense to Vermont and Vermonters is really important and unusual. When you say it aligns with Medicare, what does that mean? So when I say it, I think about it in the ACO program, we would be able to offer the same rules and same payment structures to hospitals and doctors, whether somebody holds a Medicaid card, or someone holds a Medicare card, or someone holds a card from Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or MVP. We're trying to make it align on the back end, so it, in a way that would reduce provider administrative burden and make the incentives more aligned with care and less aligned with, well, I have to do this for this insurer, that for this insurer, and measure quality in a different way for two other insurers. That's basically what we mean. Can we align payment and practice for hospitals and docs and other agencies through the all-payer model? The other thing that makes it special is all an ACO is is a collection of healthcare providers, and it gives us an opportunity to have those healthcare providers take accountability and real financial responsibility uh, for their patients. Now, 
every single doctor and nurse I've talked to, having done this last five, six years, is 100% committed to their patients and their community. It's not about that. It's about can we create incentives in a business model that align with that care and pay people better who do better as far as caring for folks. And then obviously, patients. This is a, I remember, um, for some people in the room might remember the former finance commissioner, Jim Reardon. He used to say that in state government, long-term planning was Memorial Day. Uh, this project requires much more patients than that. We're on performance year two of the six-year agreement. And so for us, even just with the claims tale that Michael Barber described, it's going to take a long time to know what happened and whether we're pleased with the results. And the last thing is, we're gonna try really hard from the state Medicaid agency not to overpromise on this one. We don't know whether the all-pair model is gonna work. We think because of the incentives it creates and the alignment with Medicare and the fact that providers are taking on this accountability for our community, that it's worth trying and we're gonna work real hard and we're gonna be transparent, but we're not in a position to say that the ACO or the all-payer model is definitely going to work. So with all that said, we'd like to just describe for you a little bit about what's going on with Medicaid. Hey, can, I, can I have a step back just really broader for a minute? Mm -hmm. Because I'm sitting here thinking, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. Um, How do, this is, as I said at the beginning, this is the, we are implementing this policy as the policy of the state of Vermont based on an agreement with the federal government. Yeah. And yet we in Vermont, as elsewhere, but we in Vermont uh, change administrations. We just, we changed administrations just now. We have a new governor who's going to give us his budget address Thursday. And two years before that, we changed administrations from one political party to another political party in terms of the governor's administra the administration of the state. Did we change policy around the all-payer model when we changed administrations? Or has there been a flow through consistency of adherence to this contract between Vermont, not between a political party, but between Vermont and the federal government. And I think that's... Yeah, it's an excellent question. I would say that in the transition from the Shumlin administration to the Scott administration, uh, and, and from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, which also happened shortly after signing oh, those documents, um, nothing in the agreement has changed. Nothing in the programming has really changed. The only change um, that I can perceive from my seat is that um, people are appropriately skeptical of the program and want to make sure that we're proving that it works. And so I feel from the people I report to a real sense of we understand the concept, we understand the theory, we're satisfied that you're implementing it and you can manage it, uh, but we're going to really focus on results. From our federal partners, I, I think, and in, Ina in is perhaps in a better position to speak to this, it's the same thing of the, the ACO is one federal program, there are other federal programs, and, and it's really gotta work if the federal government is going to continue its efforts here. Um, and so we, we have to have this sort of patience, but a real focus on whether we're getting where we wanna go. Uh, you keep saying you're trying to determine whether it's going to work. Mm -hmm. What happens if it doesn't work? So that is a really good question. And that's why I think it's important to remember that the ACO program is a means, not an end. If Commissioner Gustafson were here, what he would tell you is DIVA, is the Medicaid uh, agency, would has three priorities. We want to get better every day. We want to execute on complex <coughs> projects, which has been a sore spot for the state. And we want to make more value-based payments. That's what we're here talking today. We, like many other health plans across the country, want to stop paying fee-for-service for, for health care, which is quantity, and start paying for quality. And so the ACO program is the biggest of about seven payment reforms that we're presently working on that tries to transition from quantity to quality. 
Now, let's say if the federal government got out of the ACO business tomorrow, right, and the state of Vermont has no control over that, um, what as a, my strong sense is that as a Medicaid agency, we would be going right out to Vermont's hospitals to say, gee, the a you were willing through the ACO to work hard with us on quality and to get out of fee for service for global hospital budgets. Is there a way to continue that? Because we'd be really interested in continuing that. Now, we think this way is superior to that way, one, because it has Medicare in it, and two, because the providers are choosing to do it themselves rather than having the state mandate that they do this. We think there's more promise and potential for long-term success, but we'd be still focused on making more value-based payments if the ACO was unsuccessful for some reason tomorrow. So. Right. Uh, all the hospitals in Vermont like ACO. Do they like ACOs? Yeah. I, I would not dare to speak for hospital CEOs and CFOs, but I will say that they're voting with their feet for the most part to join the ACO program with the exception of Copley and Grace Cottage. Why is that? You'd, you'd, uh, you'd have to talk to them. Um, what we want to see, and you will see on the slides, is progress over time, that more providers, more hospitals, and more Medicaid members are joining the program. And so far through the three years in the Medicaid program, we are seeing that. We've gone from four to 10 to 13 hospitals in the three years in the Medicaid program. I have just one other question. Sure. When you talk about coordinating health care with your providers, do you ever restrict uh, the care that you know providers may be may be giving? Uh, there may be too much uh, uh, care in one one area as opposed to another. No, and and there's an important difference here between as the video said between ACO and HMO. There's nothing about the ACO program that restricts a Medicaid beneficiary's ability to go get for someone else. Uh, and we, there's also no utilization management, which you'll hear about in this committee. Usually when people talk about what's called prior authorization. So an insurance company, which Medicaid is a health plan, um, much like other private insurers, has provisions where it will say, look, we just don't authorize that care. Um, the ACO does not take that responsibility from, from us. There is no situation where the ACO is denying someone care while standing in the place of an insurer. It's just not part of what they do. Also, we measure um, access and quality to try to make sure that we're not seeing um, sort of big dips in care as we're moving from fee-for-service to capitated payment models, which we'll talk a little bit more about. A very good question. No, I think those are in, your, your, in different ways touching on some of the same issues that, that we need to keep coming back to, which is uh, I mean, one of the underlying concerns that's been expressed uh, by numbers of legislators or members of, of various stakeholders, really. What's is, it, is there some is there some kind of incentive for the ACO uh, to not provide as much care in order to make the bottom line work, to save the money, et cetera? And and that's that's one of the ongoing. And, and then hospitals too, as well. You know, for all the providers. You know, when, once you get into the capitated business, mm -hmm. is it is it is there actually an incentive, a different kind of perverse incentive, rather than perverse incentive to just do lots more because it's fee for service and you can generate money? Is there a disincentive to provision of care in order to save the money and make the make it all quote work? And I, and I would urge the committee to think of this not as an ACO problem but as a value-based payment problem. Yes, and as we'll get into in a moment, uh, on January 1st of this year, we launched a mental health payment reform, which has a case rate. And one of the things that we worry about is a lack of access to mental health care. And so what we did in that program was to say, okay, we're gonna guarantee you payment, designated agencies for this group of people. Uh, if we see that the access to your services, for these particular services, dips below 90% of the previous year, we're going to take some money back. Because we need some mechanism to make sure that you're still serving enough people. right? And so in each value-based payment, we have to think hard about how do we maintain access and how do we make sure we're not creating incentives 
to reduce the amount of necessary care that's out there. So it's just a value-based payment problem that we have to work through in each case. And I think it speaks to the issue of this is not going to be the only first and only time we talk about all fair model when we hear from one care. It's not going to be the first and only or the next and only time we hear about from one care. But that there, there's really an ongoing, there's an ongoing responsibility, I believe, of the health care committee to stay abreast of the developments in all of these in this healthcare reform to stay alert to concerns that are brought to us from stakeholders or outside parties or patients or whomever in order to stay alert to what our responsibility is in terms of uh, understanding and then overseeing at some level from a policy point of view uh, what's happening. Amber. You mentioned mental health care that you started do you have a different set of measurements, quality measurements, or are they using the same things that Sure, that's a great question. And I think it, it gets to bigger questions about quality metrics across these different types of initiatives. For the all-payer model agreement, there were a number of quality measures that the state is accountable for, for meeting. Um, and to the extent possible with our ACO contracts, the different payers have contracts with the ACO, we've tried to align the quality measures with those that are in the all-payer model agreement. So in the spirit of alignment, we looked to the all-payer model agreement to see which measures might make sense for a mental health payment reform project. And we found that there were some that made sense and there were some that were less relevant to the provision of mental health care services. And so where that was the case, we also looked at other measures that the state has been collecting and that the designated agency network of providers has been monitoring over the course of the last several years. And we tried to draw measures from those sources so that there would be some alignment where appropriate, but also measures that were more targeted to the services that were being provided. So, uh, with that framing that we're really pursuing value-based payments and the ACO program is the biggest but just one of the value-based payment programs we have, we're going to talk a little bit about each of these programs. So as I said, we have those three big data priorities, uh, value-based payments, performance on information technology projects, and just performing, improving the day-to-day -day performance of our Medicaid agency. Um, the all-payer model is part of payment basically our payment reform in action. And Alicia led our payment reform team. She's recently taken a role uh, more broadly over our three reimbursement units because we set rates for um, new payment models, value-based payment models, our standard fee-for-service rates, which still exist, and now DIVA also oversees nursing home rates um, and private non-medical institutions. And so that's, that's Alicia's uh, piece of this. And so, so far this afternoon, we've really been talking about the all-payer model, and that, that is our contract with CMS to enable ACO-based reform. And so CMS, as Mike Lanina said, provide payment flexibility and some local control in exchange for meeting quality, financial, and scale targets. Uh, and so our Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program is our component of that, uh, and it's growing over time, and the table here gives you some sense of how it's grown. Certainly. So you can see in the table that in the 2017 performance year, which was our first performance year for the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation Program, we had four hospital service areas that were participating. That equated to roughly 2,000 providers, and we had approximately 29,000 Medicaid beneficiaries who were attributed to the model. As Michael noted, over the last two years, we have seen growth in terms of providers voluntarily choosing to participate in the ACO network. It went from four communities in 2017 to 10 communities in 2018, and now 13 communities in 2019. Um, with additional providers agreeing to participate in this model voluntarily, we also have more Medicaid beneficiaries who are attributed to the program. So in the current performance year, we have approximately 79,000 Medicaid beneficiaries who are attributed. So to put some context on that, uh, the federal government says, hey, look, for the purposes of scale, we want a model that has all Vermonters in. 
So for Medicaid, we have people that have full Medicaid benefits packages, so they're real full beneficiaries, and then people with other limited benefit packages. When we think of scale in the Medicaid program, we're just thinking about those full Medicaid beneficiaries. So if you're a dual eligible, you're eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, you're on the federal rules state that you're on the Medicare side of the street for scale. So for Medicaid, we have about 79,000 out of 140,000 full beneficiaries, approximately, that number changes all the time, but that's the ballpark of where we're at for scale. So it gives us you know, 55, maybe towards 60% of full Medicaid beneficiaries that are presently in the ACO program. Now, just to tie into what Michael said a little bit, we keep thinking of ways to look at scale. On one hand, this is a, an issue where we expect the ACO to persuade healthcare providers that this is a good thing to do. And so to the extent we have hospitals that are so far choosing not to be in the program, or federally qualified health centers or other folks who have chosen not to be in the program, the ACO is gonna have to do the hard work of convincing them to get in. At the same time, the federal government has a bunch of complex rules about how to count people, and, and to be quite frank, some of them don't make any sense. And so getting those people inside the program would be especially difficult. And so DIVA is working on, um, is going to pilot this year, some what we call alternative attribution models to see if we can get people counted in a different way. And our all-payer model agreement allows us to propose to the federal government alternative ways to count people. So, you know, scale's a big picture thing, and then we think, how do we solve the problem? Well, the ACO is gonna have to make sure people wanna be in its network, and then we need to work on those federal rules for how you count people, because not all of them are tailored well to the state of Vermont. So I have to say, I don't understand. We have 13 of how, well, how many hospital service areas? 14. 14, so we have 13 of 14 hospital service areas. Remember, Dartmouth is included, though, in the number of hospitals. Right. Okay. But I thought you said Copley and Gifford's College said no, so mm -hmm. there's 14 and 14. Dartmouth gets out of that. So those, are hosp so those hospitals are participating mm -hmm. for Medicaid. But that doesn't mean all the providers in their hospital service area are participating. And attribution is tied to primary care. And so, for example, a couple of years ago, one of the big milestones we saw this year and where we had really pushed the ACO was participation of federally qualified health centers. So you can have UVM in in Chittenden County, but if you don't have community health centers in Burlington, where lots of people get their primary care, it doesn't make as big a difference as you would think. And so this year we're seeing a migration of some FQHCs into the program and that makes a difference. Right. And so we're trying to tease out for those other 60,000 people, how much is missing primary care folks? And then how much is just technical problems with attribution due to federal policy? And that's one of our big goals in 2019. So it's just by chance, I think I understand, correct me, I'm way off, but that the community the FQHC for Chittenden County is going to participate starting in 2019. Is yes. That, and they're going to participate for Medicare and Medicaid, but not for commercial. Is that what I, uh, or I, something close to that? I heard the same thing. Okay, so we are all hearing it, but someone's communicating with somebody officially. Yeah. So I assume that somebody's talking to somebody at Diva. Well, yeah, they, I mean, so we would, we, um, this is where it's interesting. If you're a state Medicaid agency. Well, actually, you're not talking to Diva, why are you you're talking to? We talk to One Care. You're talking to well, one. And, and One Care communicates with CHCB. Uh, there are moments where we have our payer hat on as Medicaid and moments where we have our Vermont healthcare system hat on. Uh, when it comes to joining the ACO, we, we try to keep our Medicaid hat on. We want to leave those discussions between the ECO and providers, so we would not normally kind of get involved in discussions with the provider of whether they want to join the ECO for Medicare or commercial insurance. And those relate to what Michael, Michael was talking about in terms of scale, getting up to scale. Those decisions are what's influencing those percentages of getting up to scale. And they're made at the local level by the 
provider in their relationship to, in this case, one care as the ACO that's the ACO is part of the all pair model, right? Again, if you're a provider and you want to join the ACO, mm -hmm. you can decide you just want Medicaid and Medicare, but not commercial insurance. How does that um, work with the old data? So, my understanding, uh, which one care can talk more about, is that you know they basically offer them as separate opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can join for one, two, or three payers. Um, and I, at least what's been told to us by folks at One Care and out in the provider community is, you know, people want to dip their toe in the water. Like this is a big change, and they want to be really careful and responsible about their business. So what we've seen is people tend to providers tend to join Medicaid first to get an understanding of how it will work with their business, both in changing how people get paid and how they care for people. And then if that is successful or comfortable, then they think about expanding. Uh, to other payers. So I think Medicaid started a year earlier. We started in 2017 with this ACO, with the, the Next Generation ACO program. And so you're seeing more folks, I think, go through Medicaid first to get a sense of how it works and then add on additional payer programs over time. But isn't that either more expensive or more complicated for the providers? Then we have different billing systems for you know, they'll have... Per, perhaps, I would also say uh, potentially less risk involved, yeah. right? Um, if you're not changing more than mm -hmm. one payer at a time. Um, but, you know, I, I think my, my discussions with hospital leadership over the last couple of years in the hospital association is that it's a really individual decision for each hospital. It's a really individual decision for each primary care practice about whether they want to take this on. So I, I don't want to speculate more than I want to about their decision making on this. My observation seems to be that more folks are joining over time and pro providers tend to start with Medicaid and then move into other programs. So I'm going to remind myself and us that what I'm real, what our goal here today and our goal over the past week and our goal here today is to get try to get a basic foundational understanding of how this all-payer model agreement is working for Vermont so that we can have more policy discussions and, and, and look more in depth about is it working, should it be working differently. And so we're kind of, I hear myself asking questions at times which kind of, let's, let's understand it as best we can knowing that we're going to come back to and have a chance to come back to asking whether we think it's a hard question, tough question, or, or a policy question about should we be doing X, Y, Z. So let's, I'm just wanting to remind you myself that to try to achieve all of that in one afternoon is way beyond what makes sense. Can we do this for another four or five weeks? <laughs> I, yeah. and, and I thought, Brian, because we're having so much fun, I thought maybe I we could continue this for four or five more hours. Wait, way to drive people off the hill. <laughs> <laughs> no, we won't be doing that. No, but I do, I do want to just acknowledge that there's a lot we're taking in, a lot of information, oh, yeah. and the questions that you're asking are actually really on point questions, and we'll need to be coming back to a lot as we deal with. It. Okay. So we talked about creating integrated that the ACO is a means on the end and the end is an integrated system of care. And so part of what Diva has been trying to do is figure out, okay, that's a nice talking point. What does that really mean? And so what we've been trying to do is pair ACO-based reform uh, with what's traditionally been called the Medicaid pathway, which is a fancy way for saying, how do you integrate Medicaid payment delivery system reform across the whole care continuum? Because when we set up the all-payer model, it's, it's based on Medicare A and B services, as Ina and Michael said. And that's a lot of what Medicare pays for. It's like almost everything except for prescription drugs. It is a lot of what commercial insurers pay for. But it's only about 35, maybe 40% tops of what Medicaid pays for. Because Medicaid pays for lots of things that other healthcare payers does not, do not pay for. And so we have a particular challenge in Medicaid of asking, 
what, is value, what do value-based payments mean in all these services that uh, we partner with DMH and Dale and DCF on? And so um, besides just the ACO program, we've been looking at other pieces of the care delivery system, and then most importantly, listening to our sister departments to say where are the opportunities to do other value-based payments, and how do they align with the APM? And so something we want to talk to this committee about more, obviously not fully today, is that um, we put out a Medicaid Pathways report this year that we're particularly proud of, and it proceeds in two sections. It talks about payment reform as a process, because we want policymakers to understand it not as a talking point, but as a process, a thing that people do every single day. Um, and then two, talk about the actual projects that are ongoing in it, which the ACO is the biggest, but it's not the only one. So uh, I would encourage folks to review the report if you haven't had the opportunity already. I think it's a, a nice summary, as Michael said, of the process that we've been trying to make a little bit more standardized uh, as we've approached these different value-based projects within Medicaid. Um, the broad overview of the process is that we, um, as part of the payment reform unit at DIVA, have been working closely with the other departments within the Agency of Human Services on four steps that we like to go through to get us from an idea to a, hopefully a new model that we can meaningfully evaluate. Um, the first of those steps involves planning. Uh, we do some work with whichever department is requesting to engage in this process to identify what the challenges there are that they can see and what problems they would like to solve. And then we think about whether or not payment reform is the right way to address those problems. Um, this part of the process involves gathering subject matter experts and other stakeholders who can inform the process throughout. It also involves quite a bit of research to understand how, for example, other state Medicaid programs might be dealing with similar challenges and problem solving. Can I kind of just say, so now what you're describing now is stepping away from the all-payer model agreement, ACO agreement, to talk about how to do a parallel payment reform, value-based payment reform, with other parts of the Agency of Human Services payments that are not necessarily a part of the all-payer model? Or did I miss uh, In a way, here? yes. What I would say is it's, we're stepping towards, OK, so we had, let's think about it chronologically. We uh, had a negotiation with the federal government in 2015, late 2014 through 2015 and 2016 for the all-payer model. Uh, while that is happening, DIVA and Medicaid started the process of saying, how would that like, really work? How would you actually go about having a next generation ACO program? And so we developed this payment reform process. So it was the process that was used for the ACO program and is continually being refined. But yes, it pulls us out of that like all payer model total cost of care in service of value-based payments across the whole care continuum. Right? Because we look at like the umbrella being not the all payer model, but being value-based payments. So you're right, we're stepping a little away from the all payer model agreement but in service of delivering on its promise of a full continuum of care. But specifically for payments that you're currently making that wouldn't be encompassed under the all-payer model? Yeah, it was. That's fair. Okay, that's what I was trying to yes. get at, that yes. these are other Medicaid payments. Yep. Or not just Medicaid, yes, but they would be Medicaid, Medicaid payments because that's your work. Yep. Other Medicaid payments that aren't encompassed under the all-payer model, but yeah. where you would like to achieve the same kind of value-based payment reform, if possible. Yes, and there are provisions. Okay, not. No, you're, you're entirely on it. And I would say yes, and the way it specifically ties into the all-payer model is as part of the all-payer ACO model agreement, there are planning requirements to align other pieces of the care continuum with the ATM over time sort of in contemplation of an extension of that agreement starting in 2023. So what might be helpful, so it would be helpful for me, maybe helpful, can you name an area or areas that you were well about that? <laughs> 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 it's likely <laughs> land. ...that are happening across the Agency of Human Services. 
Um, the first is certainly the, the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program. Uh, as Michael mentioned, that's kind of our flagship payment reform model because it was most directly connected to the all-payer model agreement. But from there, we have worked with uh, the Department of Vermont Health Access and other departments within the agency to begin work on several more projects, including a project related to applied behavior analysis, a project for children. Certainly, it's a set of services for uh, children with autism spectrum disorder diagnoses. Um, we're trying to see if there is, for that project in particular, a way that we can make what is currently perceived as a challenging fee-for-service billing arrangement a bit more flexible for providers so that they can have the ability to deliver the right amount of care when they're interacting with the child. Um, we're working with the Department of Mental Health on children's and adult mental health payment reform. As Michael mentioned, that launched at the beginning of this calendar year. We're working with ADAP on a residential substance use disorder treatment payment model. That ADAP is not very useful. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we're working with the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, or DALE, on a developmental disability service payment reform project. And we're working with the Department of Health Children with Special Health Needs Unit on a Pediatric Palliative Care Payment Reform Project. Right. Going back to developmental disability services, will that be including uh, Alzheimer's or dementia patients? Is there any, will there be something there for them? I'd want to go back and look at, we're sort of at the beginning, uh, we're in the middle of this one, and I just don't want to misspeak, so I want to go back and see where okay. um, I'd be able to know that. What, what was in our, our model, and make sure <coughs> it's I know that Brian has a particular interest in Alzheimer's issues, and really so, um, no, okay, you, you shared that with me. Um, so, understanding what, what, where that fits or doesn't fit into some of this is, will be a particular interest and it may not fit within certain categories but then the question is where does it where does it fall thank you and, and what i really appreciated about these payment reforms particularly uh, the mental health payment reform that just launched and the development of disability services one that is a big mountain to climb and we'd love to launch on january 1st of 2020 uh, is that you know there's an idea in aco based reform that it's really hospital centric and I get that because of the payment model, uh, but we're trying really hard at DIVA to go to our sister departments at AHS and say, look, we know that you, you have good ideas about how to change payment. We have people that specialize in how we think about value-based payment models. Let's work together, right? And so these ideas have really bubbled up from the departments themselves. Uh, and it's been great to be their technical advisors and really support them on this. And so we're, we're grateful for that excited to see what happens with these uh, seven projects or six projects they keep inventing one are these projects these reform projects um do you have the money for them is it going to is it part of your budget uh, projected budget um, so one of our uh, guiding principles representative page is to payment reform projects ought to be revenue neutral that this is about how we pay not what <coughs> level we ought to pay at um, well, because we don't have the additional money in our budget, and frankly, uh, we really value stakeholder input, and if it becomes just about whether I'm paid enough, we will never get off first base to have a discussion about how to really implement payment and delivery system reform. So we acknowledge that tension, but we all sort of mutually agree that we're not, that this is not the space to have that this discussion. This is not the place to lobby for additional funding. This is the, this is the place to lobby for a more flexible way of providing a service. Uh, that's already being yeah. That's exactly right. And I'm right. told there are various buildings in Montpelier where it's appropriate to lobby for <laughs> <laughs> additional funds. And I've heard there's different points of view about that. <laughs> <laughs> because we see different right. different right. Different right. Different well, we'll find out Thursday, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. But that's, that's an excellent point. Because it, they, the conversations generally start with more. And then we say, look, there are plenty of problems to solve. But some of them are really basic that it's, um, you know, basic conceptually, but really hard to fix on the ground. So on, on children's and adult mental health, we had a situation where DMH, uh, Department of Mental Health, DIVA, 
are paying for the exact same thing in different ways for a different amount of money. That does not make any sense for Vermont and Vermonters. And so part of the project is just trying to unwind things like that and to make it so if someone's house is on fire, uh, a DA isn't saying, well, do I use the DMH hose or the DIVA hose? Like, just use the hose, right? And so we, we tried really hard to prioritize common sense fixes in these payment reforms. So I'm remembering, this is from many, many years ago now, but there was an attempt to try to bring services for children and families into the community uh, and do family intervention or family, uh, I'm not saying it right, to, uh, to go out into the community to intervene on behalf of certain adolescents and families. And I, I remember in the agency where I was the director of it, they were, they were like tied in knots because Medicaid would only, or Medicaid primarily, would only reimburse for a psychotherapy session that was had one-on-one -on -one with somebody. But that's not what was really going to be the most useful intervention for that adolescent or that family. You know, maybe it would be sitting down with the teachers at the school and sitting down with other people. And there was a, it, it, it's basically, it was a payment reform effort to try to say, isn't there some way to change the way, even if it's just the same amount of money, to change the way we can get reimbursed so that we're not having to try to do what we, to, that what, we're, what we know actually makes sense doesn't fit with the payment scheme that we're strapped with, which is a psychotherapy in an office mm -hmm. scheme. And it took a long time, but you know, there was some success. And, and that, that's really the basis of the bargain here. I mean, we're trying, um, the ECO program is the most refined so far to say, OK, providers, if, if we give you more flexibility and we guarantee you some level of payment, can you do it better? Because we know there are all sorts of ways in which um, it, you know, it presently doesn't make sense. So those those are the six that we have. Um, we also have, I think, for oh, there's nothing worse than using the internet in front of people. Um, this document, which you have before you, is also just sort of a more detailed summary of the payment reform projects. And so we, um, it, if the chair would like, we can walk through each of these now or, or at some point later. These are just a deeper dive on those six projects. Some point later. <laughs> and then um, circling back to the ACO program, I think we've again tried to be really modest about the results of that program. Uh, I know just to tie a few loose ends from before, uh, we've gone through one, 2017 was the first program year that's been completed. <coughs> Uh, it took us until the late summer of 2018 to figure out exactly what had happened in 2017. Uh, so there is a lag time to that. So it's probably going to be sometime in the spring or summer of this year that we'll figure out what happened in 2018. Uh, that's due in part to the claims lag. It just takes several months for us to know everything that happened. Uh, but in general, we can say a couple of things about the ECO program. Uh, one, it is growing. As you saw in that chart, we're seeing more providers and Medicaid members in there. Uh, number two, where so far um, expenses are coming in right around the target, right, um, which is a good thing. We, we set a price for services for the ACO for the year, uh, and then we provide basically um, monthly payments for part of it. And then some fee-for-service payments come in as well, because we never limit where people can go for services. Uh, so far, we're seeing a little more, we think, utilization of primary care for people inside the model rather than outside the model, but we want to be really careful with that. Say that again, Mike, you think you're seeing? We're seeing people inside the ACO program, we think so far in the first year, uh, seeing people inside the ACO use the primary care doctor a little bit more the people who are not with the ACO program. That's something we're clearly going to keep an eye out on. Um, and then we're able, we think, to administer the program, which is kind of a big deal. We didn't know this when we started in 2017, that we could actually pay in a different way and measure. We had done all sorts of readiness reviews and checks. But we think, basically, we can do it. Um, and then the ACO hit about 85% of their quality measures uh, in the first year, and we're going to keep an eye on that. 
I think it's important, though, to realize that we're deliberately a diva being really incremental about this. Um, we started off with a smaller group of people in. Now there's a larger group of people in. We started off saying, OK, about 1.5% of the money that we pay you, you have to meet quality measures to get to earn that. It's now about it's now about two percent. Sorry, it started at 0.5 percent. Now it's up to two percent. Uh, we have risk, which is just a fancy way of saying if they overspend, they owe us some money, and if they underspend, they get to keep it at a certain level. Has gone from three percent to four percent. So we're really looking just to make incremental progress on the ACO program, and we're happy to come back and, and talk more about that completed program year as well, because it deserves its sort of its own attention. One other question. Um, urgent care centers mm -hmm. outside of you know, primary care providers and you know, emergency rooms, where, where do you, are you even looking at that or, or, or dealing with that? So um, I know that the legislature directed HS to study freestanding health clinics, and I think Bacchus can speak more about that. Um, for us, I actually asked our provider member relations folks last week whether we're seeing any of that. We've enrolled in Medicaid urgent care clinics that are affiliated with hospitals, but I don't believe we've enrolled like minute clinics or free choice MD or any of that. Uh, we're, you know, we, um, we as a Medicaid agency haven't talked a lot about that, and so we haven't taken any sort of position. We can't help but look across the country and see a lot of it. Yeah, and um, certainly with the, uh, you know, pressure on the yeah. provider. So, and, and I think that um, the freestanding uh, health facility work group concentrated a little bit on that and then a lot on the ambulatory surgical center. Um, that's been discussed the last few years. So we keep an eye on that, but I don't think we have a refined position on it at the Medicaid agency. Um, would it be possible to send us a link to the Medicaid Pathways report? Of course. Thank you. I think we, uh, if it it helps, but you, Mr. Chairman, we can send that. We can send a little report we did on the results of the 2017 ECO program. Okay, I'll send it to Demis, and then she can copy it to the members and also post it on the course committee website. Happy to send both those. Great. This may be a later question, so you can just cut me out. When you, you're you getting more and more hospitals, you went from 4 to 13, mm -hmm. do the results of the quality metrics take into account the different, maybe some areas mm -hmm. of the state have more health needs than others. And when you review the quality metrics, is that taken into account? So I'm going to defer the question on quality to Alicia. I would just say that um, on the front end, when we set the price for the ACO, that's based on the claims history of all those people. So to the extent, you know, we used to have Chittenden County and now we have Chittenden County and the Northeast Kingdom, to the extent uh, healthcare is used more or more costly there, that will show up in how we set the price for, for those folks. But I would defer to Alicia. For the quality performance, we are only looking at performance for the full ACO network. So your, your point is right. The network looked a little bit different when it was smaller and only four communities than it does this year when it's 13 communities. But the results of the quality measures will be calculated by pooling performance from the whole network of participating providers. So it might look a little bit different, but to Michael's point, the connection between the quality performance and the financial aspect of the program relates to how we're setting the rates based on which individuals and communities are actually in. Now, I would add one more thing that's sort of in the spirit of your question, but not directly there, is um, we ask ourselves at Medicaid in our program, hey, what is the role of local variation or local innovation in the all-pair model? And so we've included some provisions in our 2019 contract that talk about some pilot projects in St. Johnsbury that start to get at that question of, well, you know, this community wants, wants to both be in the ACO and do something different. What does that mean? And so we're going to spend 2019 working on them on various projects to try to see how much local variation and innovation can happen underneath this, this all-pair. 
another little follow-up question. You said some some um, the metrics if you're finding out that they're using more primary care is that in some places than others is what she said. And if or for the government, is there a do you have any I know the quality metrics are basically numbers. Is there a narrative as to why people would be using primary care? I mean, would we know why or would we just know that they're using more? I think we don't know why quite yet. Like Michael said, it was one of the interesting indicators that we saw when we were looking at utilization patterns in the first year of the program. Uh, what we're hoping to do as the program matures is start to understand some of the reasons behind why there might be differences if those differences persist. I think that's one thing that we'll certainly want to know is once we look at the 2018 performance, is it the same or is it a completely different pattern? If it's the same several years in a row, then we know we'll have some sort of signal that we can be working with one care to understand a bit better. I think uh, um, one thing we did not, or at least I did not, fully appreciate before we started the program was how difficult it is to assess what's really happening when you're not fully at scale. Well, that was my because other, that was the other question of how can you account for that, you know, you've just, you've gone from four to 13, so you've got, is it deferred maintenance that people are using primary yeah. care more, we, you know, just to get Oh, us? there's there's a whole is bunch it, of things. I mean, first of all, having a base years of experience that mm -hmm. were right around the time the ACA was rolled out makes it hard to figure out historically what was going on. Um, but then, other than that, you know, we've gone from 29 to 42 to 79, but they're not the same people. Mm -hmm. So now we do things like a, what we call the stayers, leavers, and joiners analysis. Oh, man. Um, it, trying to figure out who's actually there, because we were really interested in those people that had ACO, were inside the ACO for multiple years, right? Because we want to see what's different, what's happening. but. Um, the sort of vagaries of the attribution, how you count people, and the fact that with Medicaid, you have so much churn. You go in and out, you go in and out all the time makes it hard because, and, and we, it's another sort of tension that I think when we started this program, we said out loud, but we didn't truly understand it. Our, our goal is really to have a predictable, sustainable Medicaid program for, for taxpayers and for Vermonters and for providers in Vermont. Um, but Medicaid's not that stable. There's a small group of people that are on it and then there are lots of people that come on, come off, come on, come off. So we're constantly talking to the ACO about what does that mean? Um, how should we think about those people? If the average length of stay for a Medicaid beneficiary is 14 months in the program, how should you think about sustainable multi-year transformation? Right? And these are a couple of years ago we weren't at we weren't sufficiently in the onion mm -hmm. to fully appreciate these questions, but now we're really taking a lot of um, taking the data and trying to figure out what the real story is and, and how best to modify the program to meet those needs. But it, that that right there, not being totally at scale mm -hmm. and having it not be the same people every year makes it really challenging to figure out what's going on without overstating the case about what you know. Brian, do you have a question? I'm, no, I'm going to wait okay. until a future time. That's fine. Other, other questions at this point? I think we'll stop there. I know. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Uh, and Ina and Michael, we have, we have had a lot of information uh, put on the table here today. And uh, committee members, thank you for your questions. That's really it's, it's useful to see where the questions emerge from. And I think they're